Hello and welcome to the podcast. My name is Father Bill W. I am an Episcopal priest living here in Austin, Texas, and I've had the gift of sobriety since December the 27th of 1972, and very grateful uh, to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and to all the people, the many, many people who helped me along that journey. Uh, These podcasts are my attempt to go deeper into the nature of addiction and also to explore some of the practices of the AA pioneers, the people who uh, were members of the Oxford group uh, back in the late 1930s, and uh, to explore some of the practices that they did. And a big part of that was something called two-way prayer, and that has been a real life changer for me and and for many people uh, who are discovering it. So I, I would encourage you to go to our website. It's called Two Way Prayer, T W O, and uh, begin to learn something about it if you, if you don't know much. And you could also sign up there for a newsletter and uh, get some information on the next workshop. Uh, we'll be doing a workshop on the, on the practice of Two Way Prayer on Saturday, October 9th from. 10 to 12 30 central time and you can drop me a line at twowayprayer at gmail.com and i'll send you a flyer on that and encourage you to send that around to friends so that uh, maybe a group of you in your area could begin to uh, learn this practice and finally i do want to thank our donors large and small who really have helped us in spreading the word about two-way prayer and its power to transform the lives of people in recovery. Uh, Very, very grateful to all of you for your gifts. Now, this series that we're doing is uh, on the book called The War of the Gods in Addiction, and it is the correspondence between Bill Wilson and Carl Jung. And in this episode, we're up to chapter four in the book, and we finally arrived at uh, what you might call the 12-step solution it certainly is for Shane, uh, and this is uh, a little bit more familiar territory for most of us. Uh, some of the other uh, episodes have, have been some heavy uh, psychiatric, psycholo- psychological, excuse me, psychological material. Uh, this one, it'll, it'll be there, but uh, I think the familiarity of knowing what's happening in the steps will bring that home to you in a, an easier way. So in this episode... <clears throat> Shayan tries to explain, I think, why the steps work. What is it that has to happen to us addicts uh, deep inside, in the depths of our psyches or souls, where addiction lives, and uh, also uh, where recovery begins? It's, it's the same place. So, uh, and, and most of us already know that place. You know, it's, it's hell. <laughs> it begins in hell. I don't, I don't know anybody who gets into recovery who, who hasn't paid a visit uh, to there. And uh, and that's the nature of the first step. And I'm convinced, uh, and I think the author is as well, that if that first step is not taken, or better yet, maybe if it isn't experienced at some very deep levels of the mind, then real genuine recovery probably isn't going to happen. So it's important to understand uh, what's what's going on, particularly in step one, particularly in, in that surrender process. And, and, uh, and the pain that comes with addiction, uh, it, it actually turns out to be foundational uh, because it is what we then can begin to build our lives on. Uh, we, we, we've been to that pain, we know it, and it has changed us as a result of the experience. This is why crazy addicts wind up saying, I'm grateful for my alcoholism. Because if I hadn't had that, if I hadn't gone to hell, I never would have found what I am now finding in life. So it's, um, it's, it's, it's an important detour, but hopefully it's, it is just that a detour on the way to our, uh, are becoming who it was that God meant for us to be. Bill Wilson said that uh, our pain and our past, uh, they're some of our greatest assets. Um, So let's go back to hell (laughs) and uh, see if we learned anything down there. I think that's uh, the point of the first part of this episode. Shane says that the healing 
process present in recovery, at least from a Jungian perspective, begins with a collapse. And it is a collapse of the ego system as we've constructed it up until that point in our lives. And and it's been false. Uh, It's been built around the persona. And and what has happened is now uh, the addiction has come along and has hijacked our true selves. So it it gets corrupted, taken over, and, and our true selves have gotten lost in the process. And as we approach the end of our drinking or drugging, uh, most of us felt ourselves really imprisoned, cut off, cut off from others, cut off from God, cut off from our true selves. Uh, The book puts it nicely. I think it says, uh, we know loneliness as few people do. And so to me, this is the hell, the loneliness, the isolation we lived in. And, And maybe it was for years eating away at us torturing us and and torturing those around us. But then, if we are among the fortunate, and and not all of us are, but if we are, there comes a really dark, dark day, a day of reckoning. And and for most of us, uh, it's when we hit bottom and we experience it as a collapse, a collapse of the self, a breakdown of our ego systems. And if we survive it, then there's often a surrender that accompanies it. Uh, uh, It's a giving up at a really, really deep level. Uh, It hit me in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, back in 1972. I was a runner, and I, and I, and I, I just could not run anymore. It was time to face myself. And I didn't have the language back then, but, but when I look back on it, I know that's exactly what happened that my ego could no longer sustain the falseness with which I was living. And, um, you know, the expression is we're cracking up and and it's pretty accurate. Yeah. We're, it's the ego system that's cracking up. Shane says, and I quote, without the surrender or collapse or relativizing of the ego. And that means cutting it down to size, getting the ego in its right, in its right sized, uh, that not, it's not too big. It's not too small. It's right sized, uh, like Goldilocks. Uh, without that, the addicted individual is still stuck and the addiction remains in control, calling the shots and dictating to the hijacked ego what it will think and feel and do. It's like we're prisoners. And he goes on, the paradoxical solution is to surrender, to admit complete and utter defeat. The addicted individual, when he or she takes step one, I think better when it happens to them, uh, they are committed to a version of ego side, to the death of a, of a self, to the killing of that old self. In spiritual language, that's what it is, the death of an old self, so that a new one can come. Uh, and have room to enter and room to grow. And this new right-sized ego comes to take its place in the world. So in recovery, we really get to live two lives. And and I think that's absolutely true. So what Cheyenne is saying here is what the program tries to teach us, that there's something deep inside that needs to happen to us, something that requires a seismic shift, a change, a psychic change, a conversion experience. It goes by all of those different names, but it has to happen at the very deepest levels of ourselves. So it's what the book says, you know, until we admitted to our innermost selves. So this innermost is, is, is uh, where we're experiencing the change. So when the, when the pressure finally becomes too much for the ego to bear, it collapses, it surrenders, hopefully, And that, for some of us, uh, seems to be our only hope that we go through that process. And I think then the first and perhaps the most important battle of the War of the Gods is over. Uh, And then what happens? Well, step two. And this is Cheyenne's version of step two. He writes, In this state of complete helplessness and collapse, the person must not only surrender, but perhaps more aptly grab on 
to something else. Um, uh, or perhaps, yeah, it's completely accept. Let me read this again. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Shane writes this. In this state of complete helplessness and collapse, the person must not only surrender, but grab on to something else, or perhaps more aptly, completely accept and trust putting oneself in the hands and in the power and control of someone or something else. This leads us, he says, to step two of AA. So <clears throat> it's a turning away from the known ego, the ego we're very familiar with. All right? But to what and to whom? Well, it's really to whomever or to whatever is out there that can help us. And we don't have to know exactly who or what it is, only that it isn't the old us. That old us does not work anymore. And that we know. So it's the faith that's required to kind of like to step off a cliff. <clears throat> but I think the truth is, if we're being chased by all the powers of hell, what, what alternative do you have to do but to jump? And, and as, as some of the saints put this, because they really go through a, a somewhat similar thing, maybe not as dramatically as us addicts, but they really do. <clears throat> and they say it's, it's like falling into the arms of God. And what we say in, in the AA program, it's giving ourselves completely to this simple program. And I hope you can feel the turn there, the transition from the old to the new, uh, letting go of, of what was known and killing us to what is new and may be frightening, but is our only hope for, uh, for real recovery. <clears throat> Shane writes, about this state of mind that accompanies this. He says, at this point in the recovery process, alcoholic or addicted individuals must blindly follow the principles and precepts of go to meetings, listen to sponsors, stay away from temptation, and follow the guidance and advice of sober strangers who have trod this path before. They need to keep turning everything over to God to keep reaffirming their powerlessness over the addiction and not try to take it back and put it again under the control of their old addicted ego system. Because if they do, the addiction will find an opening, a crack, a foothold by which to re-enter and take complete control of the person once again. Now, to me, this sounds uh, something like AA boot camp. And and, you know, I, I think it's fairly accurate to look at it that way, that at this stage of the surrender process, when we're at our bottom, then we need to move into a new territory where the old self is not in control and the new self is not yet firmly established. It's a very different state and, and, and we're not at all used to it. And we, at that point, we really need to trust the people who are around us, who can lead us uh, in, into this, this new level of consciousness, and preferably people who've escaped uh, from hell themselves and who know the, the way out. Uh, and, and that's, they almost named AA, one of the thing, names they considered was uh, the way out, uh, because that's the way they experienced it. Uh, Shane con continues, uh, he says, this idea of hitting bottom and giving up completely on getting sober through the abilities of the ego is not an archaic outmoded notion of AA. Psychodynamically, it is the most crucial and necessary step in initiating and setting into motion the only chance of healing and recovery possible for the alcoholic or addicted individual. Without it, everything else becomes futile and ineffective. <clears throat> and then he looks at uh, how they did this surrender in Akron under Dr. Bob, writing, uh, Dr. Bob actually required of the prospective AA members an initial act of surrender of their egos in which they had to get down literally on their knees in a dramatic symbolic gesture and say a prayer, acknowledging their powerlessness over alcohol and their reliance upon God or the higher power before they were free to attend an AA meeting. 
and, and he ends up saying that the ritual is no longer required, but the essential surrender of the ego still is. And, you know, I had that experience when I was introduced to the Oxford Group uh, material at 20 years sober. The man who taught me that asked me in his living room if I had really done a surrender with another man. And I said I had not. I wasn't raised in that school. Uh, and I did. He said, well, would you get down on your knees and, and just give your life to God? And, and I did it. And, and, and something shifted inside. And I could, I could really feel it. And, and uh, to this day, uh, when I'm leading someone in through the steps, that's a part of my process. Um, if they're willing to get down on their knees and I'm down there with them and we make that surrender uh, and, and you feel it. Uh, and, and if you can do it externally, sometimes it has an impact internally. So what's the expression? Bring the body, the mind will follow. Uh, so in the first three steps, <clears throat> what's happening here? Well, I think you could say that a new connection is being formed. It's a psychic connection, a soul connection. And it's what Jungians refer to technically as the ego self axis. And that self is with a capital S. It's the link, the line of communication between the surrendered ego and the self. Their term for the God that is within, not out there, but inside of us, waiting, wanting to be realized through us. As you know, as the big book says, the great reality is within. And Jungians believe that. And they believe that we have important business uh, with this great reality within. We need to be connected with it, in dialogue with it. And that is why I think two-way prayer is so very, very vital. And it's the lost element to the recovery process that um, people need to find. And, and when you do, what you watch, your spiritual program will really uh, come to life and uh, you'll grow, start growing by leaps and bounds. <clears throat> so anyway, the important question becomes, uh, is my ego right-sized in its relationship to this power? Is it humble? Is it teachable? Is it in service to the self or is it demanding that the self be in service to us? In short, am I rightly related to God or am I not? And, and this, this, this equation, this relationship uh, is really everything. I mean, everything rests, we say, on the maintenance and growth of our spiritual condition. And this is what we're talking about, this ego self axis connecting link. And, and, and this is where the next set of steps uh, come in for Shane. He's, it's, and he talks here about clearing the pathway between ourselves and God. He labels them steps four to ten, saying, <clears throat> here we clear away the obstacles, the blockages, the things that get in the way of that right relationship, things that contaminate us and set us up for relapse. Just some key psychological points the author makes re regarding these steps. On step four, he notes that the moral inventory, it must be our own and not the others, that the process is intended uh, to work against pride, against inflation, against self-righteousness. In Jungian language, this is what they call shadow work recognizing the dark side of ourselves. This is step four, uh, where we go inside and we begin to bring out the things that we want to hide, the things we want to bury. And Shayan identifies them. He says, they are all the incompatible thoughts, feelings, desires, fantasies, and actions that we have suppressed or repressed into the personal unconscious, along with our more primitive uh, or differentiate, undifferentiated impulses and instincts. And he says, just add then our human tendency to power, inflation, and dependency. And this description of the personal shadow is very close to Bill Wilson's view of the distorted instincts 
in alcoholism. And that was one of, one of Wilson's ways of looking at this, that there's something very wrong, very deep inside, that these instincts that live at the level of unconscious uh, reality uh, overstep their bounds. And when they do, they overtake us. <clears throat> so these buried things need to come to the surface. And in a sense, they are what will give birth to this new self. And birth is painful, or so the women uh, tell me. My wife tells me that. <laughs> and these steps are painful, and I tell her that. And maybe especially steps four and five. Uh, the author quotes Jungian analyst Marion Woodman, who encourages addicted individuals to take up and bear the cross of their inventory and confession so that what? So that transformation can occur. She says, quote, <clears throat> By contracting that energy in a numinous experience of suffering, dying, and then rising again, uh, the ego sacrifices itself to a higher power, is enlarged and transformed, so that it returns to ordinary life with a new outlook. <clears throat> this suffering isn't meaningless, like the suffering uh, that happens in addiction this kind of suffering actually has the power to transform us. Uh, and Shane quotes Bill Wilson here. He says, or Wilson says, <clears throat> nor can men and women of AA ever forget that only through suffering did they find enough humility to enter the portals of that new world. How privileged we are to understand so well the divine paradox that strength rises from weakness, that humiliation goes before resurrection, that pain is not only the price, but the very touchstone of spiritual rebirth. And then he touches on six and seven. And he doesn't point this out, but uh, Wilson says these are the steps where he put the four absolutes of the Oxford group, honesty, purity, unselfishness, and love, these become the guideposts for the new ego, directions towards building this new self. Uh, the old self is none of these, you know. Uh, we addicts are anything but honest, pure, unselfish, and loving when we first arrive here. But that's the goal, is to become more so uh, in each of those four areas of our lives. And that's what we measure our, our growth by. Not that we achieve it, but, but that we're moving towards it. Uh, and, and, and what it's very clear in, in, in six and seven, uh, is that God is going to do this for us. We're not going to achieve it out of our own power, just like we couldn't get sober on our own power. But if we're, if we're willing to move in this direction, if we're willing to, to grow spiritually, uh, then God will do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And that is the promise. Shane writes, the readiness of a person recovering from addiction to place everything in the hands of the higher spiritual power and to rely on transcendent grace, not personal ego, to be transformed, follows the best of all the great spiritual traditions. Steps six and seven continue to emphasize the humbling of the ego, which makes it much harder for the addiction to get back in control of the recovering individual. These steps uh, are like inoculations that protect us and prevent us from getting reinfected by the potentially fatal disease. Uh, the author says that steps eight and nine continue the process of ego reduction, that here we take full responsibility for our actions. We pay back the debts, the debts we owe. He says, quote, these steps are rooted in ego humility in selflessness and honesty, and in taking personal, psychological, social, and moral responsibility for our behaviors and their effects on others. In short, basically, we're cleaning up our act. We're cleaning up as very best we can our side of the street. And as we do that, then the ego self axis, that, that connecting link is able to function properly. In, in 10, 11, and 12, we start living a new way of life, <clears throat> a life of watching ourselves for ego inflations because they, they creep back in, uh, of bringing uh, 
our problems uh, to God for guidance and direction in step 11 and in carrying the message uh, to the other lost souls from hell in step 12. Here's how the author puts step 11. He says, to know the will of God, we must pray and meditate and reflect as well as listen to our bodies, our emotions, our thoughts, our intuitions, our dreams, our deepest values, and to what the universe sends us through other people and through synchronicities. Um, Once we have discerned God's will in our life, then we can pray for courage and strength to carry it out. Uh, And then finally, step 12. And here we have that much sought after spiritual experience or spiritual awakening. And sometimes it's a direct experience of God, an experience of another world, of another life. Uh, Jungians refer to it as the golden world uh, that we get a glimpse of, that we get a taste of. Uh, In AA, what do we call it? We call it the fellowship of the spirit. It's, it's, it's uh, It's what's at the end of the journey, and it is also what comes to us during the journey. Uh, we, we get glimpses of it as we go, tastes of it as they happen in a meeting, in working with a friend, in looking at a sunrise. You never know when, when it's going to show up because you're not in, in control of it. But when it happens to you, you know it's there and, and, and you know you're so, so very different from, from who you were before. One of the one of the real uh, eureka moments that I had in my recovery was um, uh, I remember uh, someone asking me about uh, the question. They asked me the question, uh, "What do you call a psychiatrist? What's what's the common term for him?" And I said, "Well, it's a shrink." And then they they hit me with the zinger. And what do you think it is he or she is supposed to shrink? Had me. It's my ego. That that the purpose of psychiatry, the purpose of uh, depth psychology, the purpose of 12-step recovery, they're really the same. They are to shrink the ego down to its proper size uh, so, so, so that it is in service to the greater self. That's the transformation that has to happen at the very deepest levels of self. And that is what the steps are there to effect. So they're not there to be memorized. They're not there to be worshipped. They're not there to beat somebody over the head with them. They are there to be followed. And in following them, in taking them as absolutely seriously as we possibly can, something happens to us at the deepest levels of self. It's a transformation. It's a psychic change. It's the exact same thing that Carl Jung sent Roland Hazard uh, to go and to experience. He he did, and and so did Ebby experience that uh, to a degree, and so did Wilson uh, to a degree. So, I mean, that's the journey. And, uh, and uh, it's really kind of a coming together of uh, good psychology and, and good 12-step recovery. And uh, I have uh, the assurance that the author of uh, The War of the Gods and Addiction, David Shane, is going to join us either in the next episode or the one after that. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. We'll dig into this a little more deeply still. And uh, if you have any questions for him, uh, hey, shoot them to me at twowayprayer at gmail.com, and I will be sure to ask him uh, when we get him here. So once again, I want to thank you for listening. Uh, I hope this information was helpful. Uh, God bless. Keep coming back. Mm-hmm.